We're going to turn our attention back over to the NBA. Keith Smith, who's our regular guest at this time, thankfully for him, uh, he was able to bump back just a couple of minutes so we can talk to Ernest there. And uh, he joins us now on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. Uh, Ernest, uh, excuse me, uh, Keith, welcome back, man. What's going on? Hey, uh, thanks for having me. Not a problem. Bumping back. All the best to everybody up there. You know, I hope everyone's doing as best they can with everything that's going on. Yeah, man. Um, and right before uh, Ernest called in, I mean, that, that unique situation where the football game was in Philly today uh, due to a shooting up here on Friday, we had a conversation that is on this show a lot, and uh, sometimes we pull you into it. Uh, but we just had a plethora of callers regarding Ben Simmons and his uh, lack of aggressiveness and all that stuff. I want to ask you this question. When you watch the Sixers team, is this season for you, for them, about anything more than his evolution between now and the end of the year? Yeah, that's a good question. I think that's probably pretty fair. I think you can look at it at this point and say they're probably only going to go as far as he takes them. Joel Embiid is great, but you know he might only be in there for 65 games or so, and you're you're hopeful he'll be healthy come playoff time, but we've seen even that go a little bit awry. Al Horford, an older guy, we know we're going to miss him some. Tobias Harris, but kind of a rough start for him shooting the ball. So really a lot falls on Ben Simmons. And if they're going to go as deep as they hope to and be a you know deep playoff run and a really good team, you really need him to step up and be that guy to lead them there. Yeah, I was going to ask that question exactly, which is, is Joel Embiid right now good enough to be the best player on the team that wins the championship as this team is constructed? Is he good enough? Yes. Is you going to be comfortable and confident that he will be available when you need him? I think that's where it all comes into. I think that's where it's a little bit, a little bit shaky. He's got all the talent in the world. He's probably the best or second best center in the, in the game right now. But the worry is, is this guy going to be there when you need him? Or is he going to roll an ankle or tweak a knee or his back or something like that and not be able to be there in a game six or game seven or a big road playoff game or something like that. And that's just, I think, where your worry is. Talent-wise, it's never been a question from the moment he was drafted. Everybody believed in his talent. It was just always about his availability. And, that you know, it's, it's cliche and it's kind yeah. of funny, but scouts really do believe availability is the best ability. Simmons down this year, 13.7 points per game. His career average is, uh, you know, about 16 points a game. So he's down there. He's down at rebounds. He's down in assists. Most importantly, he's down in free throws per game. Uh, he's down to attempting three free throws a game. To put it in perspective, Keith, for our Philly audience here, Markel Fultz is averaging, is shooting 82% from the line. This is a guy that couldn't shoot a free throw. He's 82%. And Simmons is down from 60 last year to 55 this year. I feel like all of his numbers are taking a, a step back. I don't know if you have a, a reason why or if you're seeing something as the league figuring him out even more, but this is a player who seems to be regressing, not evolving. Yeah, I think the counting stats are a little bit misleading just from the standpoint of I think they've asked him to be a different player offensively. He He's not doing it really last season. He did all of the facilitating of the offense. He was the guy who brought the ball up. He got them into whatever sets they were going to run. He made plays off the dribble. Now you see a lot that he ceded some of that to Al Horford and Josh Richardson at times where it's, all right, we're going to get, get give the ball up here and they're going to run the offense. And unfortunately, he's not a real useful player without the ball in his hand. He would kind of become somebody who, you know, just kind of drifts around the perimeter a little bit or he's hanging out in the dunker spot some or, you know, whatever the case is. And that, that becomes tough because it's really hard to build an offense inside out when then you've got him and Embiid or clogging things up inside if Horford's facilitating from the top of the key or if, if he's up at the top of the key, Horford and Embiid, and that gets, gets a little tough. So I think some of that's been changing role. As for the shooting numbers, that's – kind of inexplicable there's no reason why you should get better and then all of a sudden get worse and it it would be fine if it was down a few percentage points that's make a you know make 10 out of your next 12 and you're right back where you you should be but when it's that far down you start to wonder all right was the improvement the year before was that the aberration and not the rule here Keith Smith, Yahoo Sports, NBA, uh, of course, covers the NBA. And uh, we'll go around the league in just a minute here, but we'll, we'll keep it with them. You know, everybody goes crazy. They lose a couple of games. 
But when they have Simmons, Embiid, and Horford, they're 4-0. Their offensive rating is significantly better. Their defensive rating is outstanding. Um, when they have full-strength team, do you watch through a you know a 10%, 15% of the season and say, that's an NBA Finals team, or is there something missing from this team? I think you feel a lot better about it than you do when any one of them is not out there. I think that that's the same thing. But then again, when you look at it, you look at any team and you take their top three, four, five players and you start – doing that thing, well, of course they're better with their best players. If they're not, that's probably a pretty big problem that you need to solve. But I think you, for for me, I look at it with a little bit of a bigger picture approach of, okay, they're, they're good, but are they going to be good enough when it comes into the playoffs? It's hard to score the ball in the playoffs. We know their defense is going to be fantastic, but if their defense finishes the year as the top one or two defense, it's not like they're going to take it to much of more of a level come postseason. Once you're up there, you're kind of up there. The question becomes when everything slows down and teams are focused and they can really game plan for you as an opponent, yeah. are they going to be able to find ways to score? And that's, that's, that's a problem. I know I, I sound like a little bit of a broken record on that case, but, but they've got to find a way to get shooting and better floor balance on the floor when it matters or they're just, or it might end up being a shorter than the playoff run that people are really kind of hoping for because I don't know that they're an NBA finals group as currently constructed. Yeah, and the one thing, you know, that bothers people about Ben is his unwillingness to shoot, but it's also when he gets into the half court situation that he kind of takes himself out of things. If he just like to me, he's a guy that we've seen him put the ball on the floor, get to the basket, kind of pump fake up and under like he could do that. It just seems that the unwillingness to want to go to the line or the unwillingness to want to shoot is really driving a lot of his deficiencies, which includes taking guys to the basket, getting down low to the paint and, you know, up and under, uh, ball fake, getting guys off their feet. It seems it all comes back to him not wanting to either shoot free throws or shoot the ball with wide open space. Yeah, there, there's a very popular Twitter joke that goes around where people like to call him Tall Rondo in, in reference to Rajon Rondo. And, and in a lot of ways, there's unfortunately a lot of truth to that, where they are phenomenal players in every aspect of the game except shooting the ball. But when you're the primary ball handler and the quote-unquote point guard for the team, if you won't shoot, that's a problem. It almost matters less that you miss than if you just will not. Because when you are known in the league as somebody who will not shoot almost no matter what the circumstances are, defenses bend everything away from you because they're not even at all worried about the threat of you making you know, one out of four because they know you're not even going to take more than maybe one out of 10 or one out of 15. And that becomes a huge problem. And that's one of the things with Simmons where we see it when he will not shoot and then he gives up the ball. It's very easy to see the defenses start really start sliding further and further and further away from him. And in the NBA, it's, it's still, we look at it and teams talk about spacing the floor and all those things, but it's still a, a tight, compact area in there with how athletic these guys are. Even the bad defenders are still generally pretty athletic and can cover a lot of ground, and that makes it really hard on an offense when you know whatever quadrant of the court that a guy like Simmons is in, I don't really need to worry about it because he's just not going to do anything if he catches it there. Why do you feel that there's not more made of it? Like with faults. He was like, you know, something mentally wrong with him, then he's hurt, or, you know, that he's got mental challenges. Why do you think it is not – why is it more accepted almost? Like, why isn't it more brought up to him directly or the coaches directly? Do you, do you find that to be odd? No, that definitely is odd. I, I think there's a couple reasons. One is he's so good at the other things that it almost masks it in a way because when they get him the ball and he's out running – there's almost no better transition player in the league outside of you once you get into the LeBron Jameses of the world who's, you know, he's still like trying to defend a freight train and in, in the uh, full court game. But with Simmons, when he can just get out and run, you know, if he can get to the hoop, he's going to finish or he's going to, you know, make a really good pass. He's, he's such a good defender. He can do a lot of things. And I think that becomes what people get focused on, especially for fans of a team. We like to not focus on what a guy can't do. And we'll focus on what he can do unless it becomes what he can't do becomes such a crippling thing. And I think as the year goes along, you'll start seeing it get picked up on and it'll get picked up on more. 
And he doesn't have the kind of built-in excuse that Fultz did, whether you believe it or not, that he was hurt and he was struggling through something and there was something going on there. I think a lot of people said, well, that's what happened with him and that's just bad luck. And here we went. With Simmons, it seems to be, hey, this guy came out all you know uh, off-season long talking about shooting jump shots. He hasn't shot one yet. But I don't care if he ever shoots a jump shot as long as he keeps rebounding, passing, and getting into the paint. Yeah. When those sort of things, things start to fall off, that's when you start to hear a lot more chirping about it. I feel, and that's a great point, Keith. I just brought this up with a caller I had a little sparring match with. Like I feel that the other things that – like he challenged me on the call, which is what are these things he does great? He gets a free pass. He's not a great player. I feel that these other things that he does that are unique and great and, and that other people cannot do – are now getting diminished because of like it's getting overshadowed. His the, the the things that he does at an elite great level are getting overshadowed because of this now for the third season. Yeah, it absolutely will, and that's really unfortunate. We've seen that happen to, to any number of players where it, it, it well one thing can sometimes change their entire career tra- trajectory. Sometimes it ends up being a thing that ends up putting them out of the league on occasion. If a guy just can't do certain things it becomes well you're pretty limited in what you can be and it's 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 rare to see it with someone like him who has all the other skills and talent you want in a basketball player and and, and i don't think it will i think he'll be able to overcome that but then what starts to become is instead of being well this guy could be an all nba guy maybe this guy could even be a you know sneaky mvp candidate you start to refine your expectations and think well all right he's just another above average point guard as long as that's the role he's in the turnovers. Uh, who, uh, Brown, who do you point the finger at when you see a team that turns the ball over? And this is consistent. This is year after year they turn the ball over. Now, they would say, well, we pass the ball more than any team in the league. We're, we fast break a lot. Uh, when you see a team that turns the ball over as much as they do, what's what alarms go off? Yeah, so first I always look at the players and are they just – careless and throwing the ball away and doing those kind of things. And then I start to look at the coaching staff and the scheme. And one of the things I see with Philadelphia is they don't run, they, they run some of the least amount of pick and roll in the entire NBA. And that that's basketball's most staple action. You, you and I could go play, could go play two on two and start running pick and roll. Cause that's what you do. So what, what, what we end up seeing here is with this is, is with, with the Sixers, I think because they don't make the game simple for themselves, what ends up happening is they end up, they, they, they get so forced into trying to create stuff out of nothing because there's no simple action that that's when your turnovers start going up because it turns into a lot of, all right, they shut down this, they shut down that. Now we're in late clock situation, make something happen. And that's when even the best players in the world start to panic a little bit and they throw the ball away. And I think that's what happened to them. And once you're now we're several years into this, you need to look at it and say, all right, well, the players aren't going to change because that's not really how it works. So you're really going to start looking at the coaches and saying, what are you doing here? Because this is not a one or two year problem. This is a three year issue. Now we're into the third year of this, where this is really starting to become a thing that's going to hold this team back. Yeah. And what concerns me the most with the turnovers is the late game turnovers. Those fourth quarters where they're up, and then the next thing you know, they're they're either up, they're they're no longer up, they're tied, or they're down, or they're down by a bunch because they're just throwing the ball all over the gym. Uh, Boston eleven and two, still firing away. Nine out of their last ten. Is this team here for the long haul? Yeah, I think they are. I think the fact that they're doing this with Gordon Hayward, who is such a key part of the early success, shows that this team's tough. I think think this is, once again, a Brad Stevens team where he has that one scorer that he knows he can put the ball in his hands and he can make plays late in games in Kemba Walker. But the rest of it is going to be pretty free-flowing. It's going to be a real equal opportunity offense. They're, you talk about ball movement, they are moving the ball phenomenally. They're getting performances up and down the roster from guys really 1 through 12 are stepping up and making plays when their number's called. And that that's really important for the Celtics because they, cause as good as Kemba Walker is, as good as 
Jalen Brown and, and Jason Tatum are becoming as good as Gordon Hayward has looked, they don't have that true superstar player that you can lean on and say, go get us 40 tonight. Maybe Walker could do that, but that's a little hard for a small guard to, to, to do those kind of things. His more just kind of happens. He does it against the, the Sixers the often enough. <laughs> <laughs> he does. That is true. I, he, he seems to have something against them where he wants to, to put up numbers against them. But So, yeah, so they, they, look, you know, they, they look really good. Tonight's going to be a test. The, the Clippers are going to have both Kawhi Leonard and Paul George, and that's going to be something I think the Celtics are really looking at because if they win, tonight they clinch a, at least a three and two uh west coast road trip and that's pretty big for a team early in the season to be able to come back and say hey we won a bunch of games here on the east coast then we went on the west coast and we still came back with a win so that it's going to be really interesting to see how they play that out tonight and and are they ready for kind of that limelight against the team i think a lot of people have pegged to potentially be a finals contender yep and uh we saw Melo back uh you just you, did you see enough from him in game number one to wonder why nobody else picked up on him other than the five and ten portland trailblazers who have been very disappointing you you could see flashes. You you can see this is a guy who still obviously knows how to play the game. There's still some scoring ability. His timing is way off as far as playing playing NBA basketball. That was very clear to see. He had I want to say five or six turnovers himself, which is even when Melo was at his peak, he he were or just another good player. He he didn't turn the ball over often like that. So I think there's some some things there. I think Portland is a unique situation where they really needed him. They needed anybody who was above six foot five that could score the ball. They, they were just dying for anyone with any semblance of size. So I think he fits in pretty well there. Now, is he going to be the difference between getting them to the playoffs and being a competitive playoff team? I don't think so, but I think, you know, by the end of the year, we'll look at him and say, all right, you know, maybe Melo earned himself one more year in the league after this one, which I think is really the opportunity he was looking for. Uh, when was the last time you saw the Spurs lose six in a row? Yeah, I, I, geez, I, never, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. Certainly been a long time. Maybe, maybe that year when they were going in the tank for Tim Duncan, that, that might have been, been Yeah, the what year. was that, 25 but, yeah, years it, ago? <laughs> you know? Yeah, right. Yeah, it's a different team. One of my favorite stats on the Spurs is I want to say they are now to 44 of 48 NBA seasons. They made the playoffs. They've only ever missed it in four, and four of their seasons in the NBA which is just absolutely absurd. But this year, it looks like it's going to be a fight for them to get back. Uh, no uh, Kyrie tonight for Brooklyn. They've been a little disappointing early. Charlotte's been a surprise to me, even though they're you know, six and eight. I thought that team would be among the worst in the league. Uh, Orlando's won three in a row. Uh, we saw the career night, really, from Fultz. Now, you're down in Orlando. You get to see and hear more about him. I was stunned to see that he's 82%. Uh, but every time we talk, it seems like his game's evolving a little bit more. It really is. He, he's really starting to come along. I think the thing there, he said it, but we talk about the willingness to shoot the ball. He's not going to be shooting pull-up three-pointers anytime soon, but, but when he gets it swung to him and he's wide open, he's going to take it now. And that's really what Orlando wants. They, you know, take it because more often than not, they believe it's going to go in and, and we'll, we'll see. And he made a couple three-pointers the other night. He, he had 18 points. He had a bunch of plays. He can really, one of the things that he excels at is getting into the paint and getting to the rim, whether it's to make a play for himself or his teammates. And then his defensive ability, I think, is something that was really, you heard a little bit about it, but I think it was really undersold. This guy is fast. He's strong. He's long. He's got quick hands. He can do a lot of things on that end of the floor, which, if you know anything about Orlando, that if you don't play defense, you're not going to play for Steve Clifford. So if you, you got to get after it on that end, and he's really done that as well. Yep, that's a guy who uh, I, I really felt the Sixers were lacking last year. Was an on the ball defender. There are times when he looks lost defensively, but when he's got his head on, he can d up on the ball. He had two threes the other night. Uh, his career high. I mean, just watch. I'm glad to see the kid really get out of this, and he looks to be a guy who's getting more minutes and more trust from Orlando. Yeah, I think for him, he needed to go somewhere he's going to be a little bit out of the limelight. I love my adopted hometown here in Orlando, but let's face it, it's not a uh, it's not a big time spot on the NBA map. It, it's a little bit of an afterthought, but I think that's perfect for him to come in here. I think it really works for him to be here, much like it probably should have worked in Philadelphia to be with a bunch of younger guys, guys who are around his age. But these are also guys who are. They've got a handful of older guys like Nikola Vucevic, Evan Fournier, Terrence Ross, now Al Aminu, older guys who have had 
you know, playoff experience now after last year's run, but Ross and Nino had been in the playoffs prior to that with other franchises. So I think that's really important because those guys are able to get him through. And also having DJ Augustine here, I think that has been really good for Markel Fultz because he's able to be in his ear all day long and tell him, you know, here's what you got to do. This is how I've been in the league for, I believe it's 10 or 11 years now for DJ and he can really tell him. And then you've got a guy like Michael Carter Williams who the situations are different, but lived a lot of the same life as Fultz of a, you know, highly touted young player, one rookie of the year, and then was run out of Philadelphia because he didn't really get any better than that and didn't improve. So I think he's got a lot of kindred spirits here that have really helped him along the way. Uh, he's Keith Smith covers the, uh, the NBA for Yahoo sports. You can follow him at Keith Smith NBA. He joins us weekly uh, in this spot here on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. Keith, be good, man. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And Keith Smith, like all guests, appeared via the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. Good stuff from him.